but to change the way the world works, or putting it a bit more cynically to build up marketing potential, Facebook needs to attract a huge number of users. What Facebook is trying to achieve is something called a network effect. This is a term coined 100 years ago by American telephone industrialist Theodore Vail. This is the essence of what Theodore Vail outlined. If you have a telephone, just one, it's pretty useless because you can pick it up, but there's nobody on the other side. There's no one to make a connection with. But if you add another telephone, add another, and another, and another, and another, this guy can talk with this guy, who can talk with this guy, who can talk with this guy, and so on, and so on. The more phones you have connected, the more benefits for the individual users, because the user has more possibilities of people to connect with. And the more people that they can connect with, the more other people will want to join. The system becomes self-sustaining and self-fulfilling. It's as simple as that. So the power and value of Facebook increases by the number of friends it connects. Many of these things are a sort of scale leads to scale. That is, if your friends are on it, you go on it. You don't do some objective evaluation of this one is better in this way and that one's better in that way. You know, it's like, why is, is the phone, you know, with its dial, why did that catch on? Well, critical mass eventually becomes the very big thing. Um, you know, for a while, Facebook forced you to be friends with somebody if they wanted to be friends with you. And that, you know, that didn't happen to work for me because I was getting 10,000 friends requests a day. People have the experience of having thousands of friends. Right? Well, no one really has thousands of friends. It's, 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 it's either the word thousands or the word friends has to be struck out for that, for that sentence to make any sense. We've seen how Facebook needs volume. The problem is the commodity it wants to accumulate is human relationships. I need to find out more about the evolution of relationships itself. I'm meeting the world authority on primate groups, Oxford professor Robin Dunbar. Can you talk me through what's going on here? What's the social life of a, of a primate group about? Well, it's all about social bonding, personalised relationships between individuals. Primates live in a really intensely social world. They spend a lot of time grooming each other. Uh, that sort of gives them the sense of bonding. The, the problem with grooming is, is it's a one-on-one -on -one activity. It just sets an upper limit on the size of groups in the end. So the most social species really only have average group size is around 50 to 60 in primates. In 1992, Dunbar came up with a formula that predicts the upper limit to the number of bonds any primate like us can ever have. And it's proved so reliable that it's become known as the Dunbar number. We sort of plugged human brain sizes into the same equation and it gives this number of 150. And sure enough, that turns up all over the place in human communities. Uh, it turns up in the military, uh, it turns up in average village sizes in the Doomsday Book, 1087 AD, it turns up in hunter-gatherer communities. So what does the Dunbar number mean for the Facebook generation, Homo interneticus? Has Facebook actually changed the upper limits of friendship previously set by nature? When Facebook's in-house sociologists analyzed all active networks, they found that, sure enough, nature is playing out online. The reality is that the average Facebook member currently has well below Dunbar's upper limit of 150. In fact, the number of Facebook friends they interact with on a daily basis is surprisingly small, typically only five or six. So while you can claim you have this huge network of people you know in some vague sense, most of those relationships, I wouldn't call relationships, you know, they're 
voyeurs. So through the Dunbar number, we found that Facebook's drive for network effect isn't changing our relationships. For me, there's something deeper going on, beyond this superficial issue of numbers. What Facebook pioneered before anyone else was status updates, fed between friends in real time. But at the beginning, it wasn't like that. Back in 2004, it was a simple college student website. I built the first version of Facebook in a couple of weeks in my dorm room at Harvard. And I, mean, I built it just because I wanted the people around me, the students at Harvard, to be able to share information with each other and, and stay connected a little bit better. I emailed a few of my friends, and they emailed a few of their friends, and within a few days, I think thousands of people were, were on it at Harvard. But Zuckerberg realized that while the web made information available, people didn't always know it was there. The problem was, browsing Facebook was like poking your head into somebody's room every time you wanted to find out what they were doing. You had to go to your friend's pages every day or you missed something crucial that they posted. And if you missed something crucial, then you didn't respond. And if you didn't respond, then your friend thought nobody was watching. And what's the point in bragging if nobody cares? Let's get fired what changed everything is what Zuckerberg did next. He completed the loop of information on Facebook with something he called newsfeed. It meant that anything you posted on your site was instantly broadcast to all of your friends and vice versa. They didn't have to go looking at your site. All updates came to them. Within a few days, I mean, we could see in our stats already that just the amount of uh, page views that people were doing and the amount of engagement that they had in the site was going up because what they were coming to the site to do was see what their friends were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and this just made it so much easier to do that. It's this culture of real-time updating and not the numbers of friends that's the big shift in all of our relationships. Constant status updates, this being in the online loop, has dragged the web into a new age, inspiring many imitators, most famously Twitter. But more importantly, what does a shift mean for you and me as we live our daily lives? I'm going to meet Sherry Turkle, an eminent clinical psychologist who's been studying our relationship with technology for 20 years. She's actively researching how the web's feedback loops challenge our sense of who we are. I think you've started to get almost a new personality type. It moves from, I have a feeling, I want to make a call, to, I want to have a feeling, I need to make a call. There's a sense in which you almost need the validation and the support of the community to in fact feel the feeling in the first place. Bringing other people into the loop of feeling your feeling, this is very seductive. So as a recipient of all of this information, how do you think this is affecting me? You start to want to hide. I cannot live the Blackberry version of my life. I cannot be, read, know all of the places and spaces and feelings and the Facebook and the, I, my life is more than I can live. We're no longer nourished, but consumed in some way by what we've created.